new and new. Absolutely remarkable. There must be like a biblical prophecy about this somewhere in the Torah. <laughs> <laughs> and Deerfield shall sprout. Like <laughs> I, 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 I want to say, I thank God for every moment that I had and continue to have in the Haim Center. I also see Hashem's plan in action and I see what Eve is creating. And it is so remarkable to see so many good friends and new good friends, right? Like, right? <laughs> new good friends. It is, it is so, it's just so beautiful. And it's such an honor to be here. Oh, and look who's walking through the door. I mean, could, could this get any better? I mean, Calgon, take me away. This is so great. I mean, I thought you were, I thought you were in the shtetl, but you're at Torah class. <laughs> you look way too glam for the shtetl. <laughs> um it is it's really remarkable and i i um i i had so much anguish and guilt and sadness for myself and for the community and i still have it because i'm jewish and you got to have a little right but i also have such gratitude for like all these new people coming in and this introverted nature probably would have not made it happen and i'm very very grateful to Eve and grateful to Judy and, and all the players and Julie and everybody, everybody who has Julie and the board, everyone who's who's brought us to this point, like we say in the Shehechianu prayer, we, we like thank God for bringing us to this point. And I actually, I really, I really feel it. And, and I, what, what I want to discuss today, it's funny because I'm seeing such vitality here and it's so remarkable. And yet what I want to, not yet, you never say, but if you say, but it means that the first part doesn't matter. You know that there's a rule of psychology. You, you are so wonderful, but right. Then the wonderful goes and she just hears what that happens. So not, but it's so incredible to see what's happening here and i want to talk to you today about a phenomenon that is from our torah um we experience it in it in particular this coming shabbat and i'll explain exactly what i mean and we're seeing it play out in the land of israel so today what i want to do um, I really, what I, one thing I'd really like to do, I, how, this class is only an hour, right? Oh, and we're already at 16. That's not fair. Or as we say in Hebrew, c'est not fair, right? C'est not fair. It's already 11, 16. C'est not fair. <laughs> uh, they don't have a word for fair in Hebrew. Okay, fine. There's no word for fair in Hebrew. That should tell you something about the word fair. It doesn't exist. Um, I think what I'll do before I tell you the deeper principle that I wanna share with you from our Torah that comes to life most powerfully in this week's Haftorah in the book of Isaiah, which we read in this particular Shabbat that coming up, it's called Shabbat Nachamu. And I'm gonna tell you exactly what it means. I'm not gonna presume any knowledge and, and, and I'm gonna share it from beginning to end, but I wanna make sure that I leave 15 minutes because a lot of the things that I'm gonna talk about for some of you are going to be new, somewhat challenging. Aspects of it, if you let it like go in, if you take it from here to here are challenging, but so fundamental to our identity as Jewish people. So before I tell you the kind of deeper Torah principles. By the way, this was going to be like just a conversation, but I nixed that. I wanted to share something with you. Um, so before I before I share with you the deeper Torah principles, I want to share with you a story of something that's happening now. Now, the story that I'm going to share with you that's happening now in the land of Israel has happened repeatedly in different forms for the last 70 years. If I say anything incorrect, I have two scholars here. I have Shana and Naomi and they can like, they're very <laughs> scholarly about Israel at this point. They can set me straight, right? Okay, so um, what's happening now in Israel? What is happening now in Israel? Right now, what you say? Okay, Shana, give it to me. What is happening in Israel right now?
yes, right, as Naomi can tell you from firsthand account, right? <laughs> um, true. But something else is happening in Israel right now. This year, 2022, how many months in are we? What? Eight? Eight, Eight months into 2022. Israel has seen an unprecedented number of olim. Olim comes is the plural from ole, which comes from the verb of comes from the word which we all know, aliyah, from the verb alot, to go up. Aliyah is to go up. I think in 2000. Uh, 19, we had 17,000 Olim. This year, we had 30,000 just in the first six months of the year, just Russian and Ukrainian Olim. I want to share with you just a little bit about what's happening in Russia, which might be like, why? Like, it's interesting. I mean, anyone would be interested in that, but like, why? 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 You know, like, you come so rarely, like, why are we talking about what's happening in ex Soviet Union? But it means it's incredibly important that we understand it, appreciate it, be in awe and reverence of it, and actually understand the, the process that it's a part of. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. 30,000, as of now, um, in 2022, 17,000 Russian Jews have come, 12,000 Ukrainian have come, not all Jewish. Of the, uh, that's kind of foggy and it's a subject for, a it's a, something to talk about at a different time, but many Jewish. And, and um, we're at, I think 30,000 with Russian and Ukrainian. Now, why is that? Why am I beginning with this? Because the Jewish agency closed. Susie knows all about the Jewish agency. The Jewish agency is the organization, I'm sure Lori and Doris know about it, that was, that and Mimi, right? That's responsible for helping Russian Jews and Jews all over the world for that matter, um, leave their host countries when in serious situations and make it to the land of Israel. They, they help them make, it's the, it's, they help them make Aliyah. The Jewish agency was closed under duress. What, that means that 180,000 Russian Jews, which I think is just about what's still there, um, can't necessarily leave so easily at this point. It's not totally closed at this point, but there is no facilitating body to help them get out. What happened? What happened? So you, what happened after, what happened after the Soviet Union imploded was Russian Jews had it made. Vladimir Putin, whatever you want to say about him, like Trump times 10, right? Whatever you want to say about him was, well, it's like we called him like the Philo Semite King. He was, I mean, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of connections. He was so good for the Jews. You could wear a yarmulke, you could make a billion dollars, you could run, you know, you could go to shul, you could you know, sail your yacht, you could own companies. It was easier to be Jewish overtly with a yarmulke on your head in Moscow than it was in Paris. Absolutely, hands down. Everyone said, everybody fell for it. They fell for it. You would have too, me too. Because it looked like Putin was like on our team enough that like we can stay in Russia. We, meaning the Jewish people. It's okay, we've got it made. We're making, not everybody, but we're making money, lots of it. We've got companies and we've got yachts and we've got, we've got power, we've got influence. We've got, we're, we're like in bed with Putin. I mean, it was like very, it was, it was very intense time, but it was great. It was great. When Ukrainian war, when the Ukrainian war came about, uh, Israel played, this is, you know, I'm just going very quickly to make a deeper point, but Israel played a very, very fine line. Israel couldn't um, overtly protest the war in Ukraine for two reasons. One of the reasons was um, more strategic that we that the Russians have control over Syrian airspace and we need to be able to fly our planes, which we had um, we had uh, we had permission from the Russian government to fly our planes over Syria in order to you know, blast arms transports that were headed toward Hezbollah-led Lebanon. So we couldn't disrupt the peace 
vis-a-vis uh, the Syrian airspace. But another reason Bennett was very, very intrepid and really playing his cards right was because there are still 180,000 Jews there. So he didn't protest the war in Ukraine quite as vociferously as he should have. People were taking him to task. He was he was slammed for being like like milk milk, milk toast on the war in Ukraine. And when Lapid came in, um, Lapid was actually quite different and said, "No, we are protesting the war in Ukraine like overtly and and." and powerfully without any ambivalence. And that's what he did. And I mean, I'm obviously simplifying quite a lot, but lo and behold, as in the name of enemies of the state, but really in order to punish Israel, the Russian Department of Justice closes down the Jewish agency, which means there is no uh, vehicle to get out Russian Jews to the land of Israel, at least not easily. It doesn't mean that the Iron Curtain is back. It just means it's not gonna be easy anymore. This is so important to understand because the reason I'm bringing it up and the reason it's so important is because for a blip of time from the time the Soviet Union imploded until last month, Okay, so let's say 89, 1989 to um, now, like one month ago, one month ago, Russian Jews, and I'm not blaming them, we would have done the same thing, fell for it. They fell for the illusion that they can chill out in their host country, that they can not worry about it in their country, that they didn't necessarily need Israel, that Israel wasn't necessarily central to their identity. By the way, you see that a lot with young Jews today. Not these two, but a lot of, a lot of young Jews today on campus, whatever, I don't need Israel. I don't like Israel. I, you know, we, David and I met our cousin, I, I'm not going to say that, forget that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> X <laughs> rewind. Okay. Um, so the um, so Russian Jews literally until a month ago thought that everything was fine. And now they realize everything is not fine. We got to get out of here. We actually have to get out of here. So much so that the chief rabbi, Rabbi Pinchas Goldschmidt, left Moscow through Istanbul and is now residing in Jerusalem. The chief rabbi left, like trembling with two suitcases, one suitcase in his hand, one suitcase in his wife Dara's hand, two suitcases to their name, got through Istanbul and are now in Jerusalem. So no more, no more chief rabbi, no more Jewish agency. We thought it was totally fine. It wasn't just fine. It was like a party. Billions and gorgeous and richness and wealth and yachts and Etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and so so now Russian Jews are of course scared of the economic situation in Russia. I think it's falling like by fifty. The GDP is falling by about fifty percent. But more importantly, they're afraid of a renewed Iron Curtain. So why am I bringing this up? Because this this week we read the Haf Torah that always come is always read after we read by Hanan, which is which is after the Torah portion of Devarim. Torah portion of Devarim and Ba'et Hanan, which begin the book of Devarim, are very or Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of our uh, of the of the five books of Moses, have more verses than like you could, you know, I think in all the rest of the Torah about the centrality of the Jews in Israel. And it's basically, you know, if you ever read, um, did you ever read uh, the last lecture by, um, what was his name? Mitch Alba? No, not Mitch Alba. No, what was his name? Pash? Is that right? Randy Pash? Did I make that up? No? The, the last, so the, he, it was some, I can't remember the story, but it, it was essentially, the book of Deuteronomy is Moses's last lecture to the Jewish people, where he says, I can't bring you into the land 
Hashem will not allow me to bring you into the land, but I want you to know everything that you need to know so that you can stay in the land and the land will hold you and the land will carry you and the land won't spit you out due to your sins, due to your estrangement from our Torah, due to um, following idols, getting tripped up, losing sight of what it means to be the people chosen to keep and uphold the Torah. This, this is my last lecture to you. This is a five week sermon of what I need to tell you before Hashem takes my life and you enter the Holy Land and you become a, a people rooted in your indigenous soil. The two Torah portions that we're reading now are, are, are the Torah portions that are filled with verses about the land of Israel, more than any other Torah portions. Now, what we have now from the Shabbat after Tisha B'Av until Rosh Hashanah is called Sheva Nechmata, which means the seven um, Torah portions of consolation. What does that mean? It means that, that Moses tells the Jewish people very clearly, this is what you need to know if you want to stay, if you want to be held and cradled in the land of Israel, but if you don't uphold it, you'll be kicked out. So it's very daunting because it's really prophesizing exile. Moses is prophesizing the harsh, painful exile that would materialize in Jewish life for 2000 years from the time that we were thrown out of the of Israel after the second temple 2000 years ago until 70 years ago is it 70 70 what 74 until 74 years ago this is so i mean this is so unbelievably miraculous. Like, I mean, I'm not telling it well, but it's so unbelievably miraculous. From two, from the time we were kicked out of our, of our indigenous soil 2000 years ago until 74 years ago, the Jewish people have been in a constant, constant state of torture and persecution and, 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 devastation and crusade and rape and pogrom and inquisition and culminating in Holocaust, literally for 2000 years as prophesied also in our Torah. But then this week on Shabbat morning, we actually read something so powerful. We read what's called Parshas, uh, the Haftorah, we call it Parshas Um, It is from the book of Isaiah. What is the book of Isaiah? Isaiah lived after the destruction of the first temple. You know, can you imagine, let's hope something changes in history and we won't see it, but can you imagine hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, I'm sure you two have thought, three of you, I'm sure you guys have thought about this a ton. Can you imagine 400 years after the Holocaust? And can you imagine, I'm sure you like have nightmares about this. And some woman is sitting on a couch and saying to children, children, there was something called the Holocaust. And one kid's on his phone. Actually, his phone's been implanted into his brain, so he doesn't even need to be on his phone because the chip is in his brain. And he's like, you know, into some Chinese Communist Party-led TikTok version of the next 400 years. And the, are you listening, children? Children, I want you to hear me. There was something called the Holocaust. And they're rolling their eyes. And they're, I'm hungry. And when is lunch? And, and they don't even, it means nothing to them. Do you know what the Khmelnytsky massacre was in Poland? That a million Jews were killed, but not just killed. They were, their guts were ripped out. They were raped. They were chopped. They were, it, 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 that's going to be the Holocaust, right? Children, listen, I want to tell you this. There was something called the Holocaust. And it's important for you to understand blank stairs. So that was the destruction of the first temple. It was of that magnitude. The, Jew, the Jews were so bereft. It was because ultimately what we have to understand was until we were kicked out of our land and thrown into exile. Exile means outside of the land of Israel. Exile means in host countries. When I say host countries, I mean countries that are not, that are not under our jurisdiction, that are not under our sovereignty, that are not our indigenous soil, but host countries, Poland, Germany, America, Spain, Russia, Morocco, wherever. What? Yemen. 
Yeah, men, anything. You want to say anything. So Isaiah is prophesizing to the nation. The nation is like destitute, like the Sha'aris of Platim. That's the word we use for the survivors of the war, like the ragtag leftovers that were left after the war that were so bereft. I mean, I don't need to tell you, you have, you have people who can tell you much more powerfully about the Shara Saplata, the, the, the remnants from the Holocaust. Well, Isaiah, Yeshaya was speaking to the version of Shara Saplata, the, the, the remnants from the, based from the destruction of the first temple. And he says to them, and this is, and this, I'm just reading you the first verse, Nachamu, Nachamu Ami, Yomar Lechem, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Dabru al lev Yerushalayim, speak to the heart of Jerusalem. Bakara maleha ki malatzav akir nitsa avona ki lakcha miyad Hashem kifalim bikol chatoseha. Proclaim to the city of Jerusalem, her time of exile has been fulfilled. So this is this is over. This is two thousand five hundred years ago. And he's speaking about a messianic era that we haven't experienced yet. He's saying to the Jewish people, take consolation. It's not always going to be like this. One day, all the Jews will come back to the land of Israel and there will be a new era of world peace, a new era of harmony among men a new era of consciousness of the one God, a new era of universal peace where the lion will lie with the lamb. Those words are actually uh, in, um, in, the, in the UN of all places. Uh, <laughs> they should really read it and think about it. But um, the, 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 the Isaiah is saying, it's not always going to be like this. There's going to be a time in history where Jews are going to return to the land and all the Jews from all the various host countries from all over the world, Jews who, and I'm not, I'm not being a doomsday prophet about America, put America to the side for a second. I just put it to the side for a second. Not that it's exceptional, but it feels exceptional. We can talk about that. It's a good question. But I'm thinking about Rabbi Goldschmidt. I'm thinking about Russia. I'm thinking about the 180,000 that are still there. I'm thinking about the complacency, which we all could have experienced about the party that was the ex-Soviet Union until one month ago, one month ago, until the Ukraine war, which is more than one month ago. But the um, Isaiah is saying, comfort, comfort. There will come a time where you're gonna see miraculous things happen, where the Jewish people are gonna come back to the land of Israel and all the nations, are going to return all the, sorry all the jews from all the respective countries whether under massive duress or whether I mean, he doesn't say this but whether under quasi duress i'll give you an example of quasi duress the jews of france quasi duress what was happening in france the you know there the arab population is growing tremendously in size due to birth rate due to very, very liberal immigration policies. We had now have a very, very, very large number of Arabs living in France and other European countries. Paris is a, feels very, very unsafe. Europeans are Europeans. They might not be, they're, they're quietly anti-Semitic. And all of a sudden you're told, you better wear a baseball cap. You better lie low. You better, right, and, and, and finally, we have we have one terrorist incident. We have two terrorist incidents. We have a beautiful woman killed, thrown out of her window. We have we have a we have a um, a uh, a supermarket shot up, and and all of a sudden, the Jews look at each other and say, "We're not safe here anymore." Now, World War II is World War II. But after World War II, it was gay Paris. Like it was, everything was passant and chapelat, passant chapelat. It was wonderful. It was like Paris is Paris. It was wonderful and it felt safe for Jewish people. Until it doesn't, until it doesn't. And they look at each other and they say, Pierre, oui, uh, Martin, oui. 
we're not wanted here anymore. And they leave. And in my Ulpan, I got, when I made Alia, uh, I, you, you're entitled to five months of free Torah, uh, not Torah, free, five months of free Hebrew learning. It's called an Ulpan. I'm sitting in my Ulpan, which is, so I go five, I was going five days a week for four and a half hours a day, right? You know, so if I weren't American, I'd be fluent right now, but because I speak English, everyone else speaks English. <laughs> so I still speak like, uh, you know, dopey, but I'm looking around my Ulpan. Okay, I'm American. The sweet guy next to me is American. And then you look a little, Ukraine, Moscow, Paris, Turkey, Venezuela, Argentina. Uh, I'm trying to think of where people, oh, uh, where people are actually from. Paris, Paris, uh, Italy, England. You, you, you're looking around, some people come from extreme duress. Some people come from quasi duress. Ukraine, extreme duress. Paris, quasi duress. America, non duress. Not yet, but, but so, so what is happening? So what's happening is, is part of the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah prophesizes to a bereft nation after the destruction of the first temple. The reason the first temple was so tragic, it wasn't a temple like another temple. It was, it was like where God concentrated his presence in a physical edifice. It was open miracles. It was, the, it was open. It wasn't like today where we're struggling in the dark and confusion and lack of clarity and we get clarity and then we get totally confused and, and, we're, and we're totally, you know, it wasn't like that. It, we went, we, they, everyone came to the temple to experience God's, God's presence in, in, a, in a palpable form. When it was destroyed, that, that was destroyed with it. So the Jews felt totally abandoned. And once the second temple was destroyed, not so many hundreds of years later, they truly felt, is God in our midst anymore or not? As they were exiled into 2000 years of incredible pain culminating in our Holocaust. By the way, I'm really told in Israel to call it the Shoah, which is really interesting. That, um, so that's a discussion for another time. Um, so, so this is prophesized in the book of Isaiah. And actually, for those of you who, who pray the Amida prayer, which is the central prayer um, that we say that is said three times a day, we say the following words. This is, I think, the tenth blessing. Taka b'shofar gadol l'cherotenu. Sound the great shofar for our freedom. Basa nates l'kabets b'luyatenu. Raise the banner to gather our exiles, okay? Here we have the word lekabets kuluyatenu that you might hear in lekabets the word kibbutz. So a kibbutz is an agricultural settlement where people worked, you know, uh, together collectively, and it didn't last. They don't really have the collective experience anymore. Um, by the way, total aside, do you know that the founder of WeWork was this Israeli who was raised on a kibbutz? So he he created this kind of like modern utopian vision of like of collective workspace mm -hmm. we work was the co collective it was like the collective workspaces they were like real hip and everybody would come and work in one but it was derived from his kibbutz sort of anyway you're going to hear the word kibbutz but we're not talking about a kibbutz lakabates means to gather in um raise the banner to gather our exiles Kabsenu, there you have that word kibbutz again. Yachad, listen to this. This is the blessing in the Amida, in, in the central prayer of, of Jewish life. The Kabsenu Yachad Mearbakan Fota Aretz. Uh, gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Barachata Hashem. Blessed are you, God. Mikabates, there it is again. Mikabates, the Shoresh, the root is. Kuf Beit Tzadi, it's kibbutz. Mikabetz Nidche Amo Israel. Blessed are you, God, who gathers in the dispersed of his people, Israel. 
so I want to, I, so, so in other words, the, the book of Devarim and the book, I mean, the Parsha, the first Parsha of Deuteronomy and the second Torah portion, which we're going to read this Shabbat by Tanan, are very bleak. Moses is saying before he dies in his last lecture, sure. you're going to come in now. I can't take you. You're going to go in with Yehoshua, with Joshua. Please know that there are conditions and you have to meet them in order to be cradled by the land. If you don't meet them, the land will spit you out. The land does spit the Jewish people out, but not out of hatred and not out of rejection from God, God forbid, which is really kind of the, the way Christianity was derived. You see, they were, they were rejected, but not at all as a rejection, but as a, as a process that the Jewish people needed to go through. And I'm not belittling the trauma of 2000 years. However, for some reason, it was, it was the process. It was, it was the, it was the process that Jewish people experienced in order to get to the, I, I sound like, um, I sound like, uh, what's her name? Uh, with the make the, Tammy Faye Baker, but this is Judaism <laughs> in order to, to arrive at the end of history culmination of history where Isaiah after the destruction of the temple says and, and we read it in the Haftorah the, after the Torah portion after the land is going to spit you out if you don't do it right Moses is saying I'm warning you I love you but I'm being tough on you it's going to spit you out if you don't do it right and it's going to be really bad for you and it's going to be really really hard for you. This is Moses' words. And then in the Haftorah, we hear, have consolation, be consoled, because there will come a time when the Jewish people will return to the land of Israel, and God will gather in from the four corners of the globe. Now, this is not in it, but I'm just going to say it. From Paris, from Yemen, from Morocco, from Australia, from America, from Russia, from wherever, the Lord will gather in all of you and you will herald in the messianic era where there will be universal peace and brotherhood. The world won't learn war anymore. Nations won't be against nations. These are the words of the prophet Isaiah. Um, and this is the process that we're in. So sometimes, and then I'm just gonna say this real quick and then we'll open it up. Sometimes you just hear little pieces of news like oh my gosh we don't we don't read papers anymore it's, it used to be like like <laughs> pretending you were reading the paper now it's like oh my gosh right <laughs> the jewish agency closed in moscow what like seriously since 1989 this little yellow building across from the coral synagogue this pale sort of you know you've been there this pale sort of yellowish unassuming building housed the jewish agency where they processed the all all the all the all, all the aliyah that got the Jews out of Russia, right? And now it's it's closed. So what I what I want to leave you with is it's very important to to know that we're part of a historical process. It's so easy to forget it. It's really easy to forget it here. It's very like it's 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 easy to forget. It's e less easy to forget in Israel because you're actually seeing, you know, like you're you're actually seeing people coming in into into um, into the airport and you know into Ben Gurion and you're actually you know you're hearing the Russian and you're hearing the French and you're here and you're meeting someone from Venezuela and you're meeting someone from Argentina. So the um, you're you're seeing it in action. But even when you see it in action. The way life is, is that we just, we, 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 we're very, we're, I'm sure you all suffer from this. I'm sure I'm not alone. Don't you ever just feel like, ugh, everything is so muted. Like, I just don't feel like passionate about any, like, I just feel everything's just kind of blah. Like, I, I mean, I don't feel alive. I don't feel awake necessarily. Like, so, I don't know, I'm just going through my day a little bit. But if you look closer, what you're going to see is an historical process that's literally prophesized in our Torah. As, as 
are we seeing it? We saw it with France. We saw it just now in Argentina. We saw it in Venezuela. We saw it. We saw. We 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 see. We we're now seeing it in Russia. You know, the Soviet Union closed. Uh, it imploded. Jews left. But a lot of them didn't because let's face it, it was kind of amazing for Jews there. I mean, this tyrant Putin. Now we understand how horrible he is. He's really just a fascist like the rest of them. But for a while, we deluded ourselves that actually it was you know, pretty good. And it's amazing to be in Jew Jewish in Russia, not for that long. Appreciate it was only like eight, you know, whenever Putin came to power until, until now, not that much time. But for those who were in it, it felt significant. We are, as a Jew, it's so amazing and important for all of us to understand and appreciate whoa, we're part of a period of time in history that's unique, incredibly unusual. And, and I'm gonna say just like one thing, but I'm gonna leave it to the, to the group to discuss. What should be my level of consciousness as an American Jew? I'm not even gonna answer the question. I'm only gonna like state it and frame it. As an American Jew, what am I seeing? What am I seeing out there to the right, to the left? It, you know, it's problematic to the right. It's problematic to the left. It's problematic. You know, it's sort of apolitical in its problems. I'm, it's, it's growing, but I'm not saying it's doomed. I'm not being a doomsday prophet, but I, what I am saying to you is as an American Jew, you want to be, and this I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. But I, I mean, I talk about this with our friends all the time, but you're in this room, but think about how many friends you have that would never enter this room. Like, where do you go? Like, isn't that a cult and what, you know? <laughs> so it is incredibly important for us to understand we are part of the process called kibbutz galiot. Again, kibbutz is like the word kibbutz. A kibbutz is a collective, an agrarian collective that didn't work because everyone wants their own money, right? It's just the way it is. It didn't work. It was a leftover. It was Jews that were still communists that wanted to believe that we could all share money, but it didn't really last. But there are kibbutzim, there are still kibbutzes in Israel, but they're not, it's not really, it's not socialist anymore. But 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 the word kibbutz comes from the, the, the root of kibbutz is to gather in. So kibbutz galiot, galiot, Galut means exile, or some people say gults. Galut, the ingathering of the exiles. When you pick up your news source and you read, uh, the minister of ju the minister of justice justice in Russia has declared that the Jewish agency is closed. Not only do we need to figure out how and in what way to act but also to understand something is happening and also to, to also have tremendous gratitude that we have Israel, which is two things. It's the Jewish home, it's the Jewish haven. We must really be grateful for both of those. Jewish homes so that like, Kids like, you know, Shana can go on this amazing TJJ trip and like fall in love with her Jewish home. Naomi comes and like for the first time and like, you know, experiences the, the her Jewish home. But to also remember it's a haven and it's still a haven. The reason I say it's still a haven is because it's been a few decades since like the bedraggled riffraff have come on eagle's wings. Like, I mean, that literally when the Yemenite, I'm not calling them riffraff, when the Yemenite Jews came, they, 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 and the Ethiopian Jews came, but they didn't even, they never even been on an airplane. I mean, uh, the, the, the operation, we called it magic carpet. It was what really was called on the wing, the, on eagle's wings. That was the, that was the Yemenite or Ethiopian. That was Ethiopian, right? That was the Ethiopian, yeah. right? Because the Ethiopian Jews had never even been on a plane. They thought they were literally on eagles' wings mm -hmm. because in the in Isaiah it says, "You will be carried on eagles' wings." So the Ethiopian Jews 
thought that the wings of the airplane were like the wings of an eagle, but maybe they weren't long. You hear what I'm saying? Maybe it was metaphorically true that they were literally on eagle's wings. Yeah. Only recently. Right, right. So, so I, I do know what you're saying. I do know what you're saying. Yes. I think most of them felt that way. We know he's a bully, but we're grateful. But I also think you have to remember if you have a child who experiences a trauma, we were talking about this last night, that trauma didn't just happen to them. It's ingrained in their cells. It is literally ingrained in their neural pathways. It is ingrained in their cells. And everything that they experience, even if they're 70 years old and they experienced the trauma when they were seven, if, if somebody shut the door and and molested them at seven, then when they hear a door shut at 77, they jump or they scream or they yell because trauma is in their cells. So I definitely think it's fair to say that trauma is in the cells of Russian Jewry collectively. So A, of course they rem in their bones, in their cells is, 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 all the forced persecution and the exile to Siberia and the inability to, to, um, to emigrate and, and, and being fired from their jobs and living in fear. It's in their cells. And for the first time, they had someone who, do you know, when Moscow opened its Museum of Tolerance, which is basically a Holocaust museum, Putin famously donated a month's salary to the museum. And the KGB, who now is three new initials, I don't remember what they are, dedicated all of its Jewish like archives from their archives to the Museum of Tolerance. It was like, of course they know he's a bully, he's a he's a he's he's can't be totally trusted. But to feel to see their leader, you know, dedicate his month's salary after it's trauma in the cells right. so it's hard for you know if, if you've been right yeah. it's not that they're like this guy is wonderful but they deluded themselves and and by the way that is the nature of galut exile is that you can delude yourself very very much yeah yeah regina so my question is would it be rabbi isn't the chief rabbi like the captain of the ship Stable. What do these people have to go to? Oh, you know, sometimes we have a worse. How do you leave the people behind? It's okay. I'm going to I am. I I think about anything else. How do you do that? I'm not sure. Well, there is also Rabbi Lazar. There are two sort of chief rabbis. There's the Chabad one and the Nan. So Rabbi Lazar. No, Beryl Lazar is in Moscow. No, the one in Russia. There are two in Moscow. There's Pechas Goldschmidt and Beryl Lazar. But I understand, Regina. I can't answer. But I, but I love what you said. I'm not judgmental, but I am. <laughs> in one sentence. Yeah. Doris, yeah. Is it possible that the chief rabbi is literally Say, if you see me, he may be saving so many people by taking their position. Yeah. And
Okay, that, that's giving the benefit of the doubt. You hear what Doris is saying? Doris, that's the angel in you. Well, this is another story, right? We know something is going on. We really always said, look, I was born at a war, but I saw her and I'm going to say, I always have enough money. Where were you born? Poland. I'm going to start from Valley no, I hear. I don't think yeah. it's. We don't have. I, I agree, but if right. you look at from nobody, yeah. and we can also feel. Oh, oh I'm sure. Yes, I worked for the Fire Reaction in Soviet Jewry for 20 years, and I came in after um, 1989. They were let out, and we had a program to help the former Soviet to become more Jewish, educate their children, learn, learn, grow, eat, whether the old foods. But we knew with Putin from the start, as things got better, we always said, once KGB, always KGB. There was no question in our minds that Putin was putting on a show, that this was a veneer, this is a who was and watch out. So when I saw the article in the paper, the Jewish agency closed, I said, OMG, this is a it's over. It's over for the Jews of Russia. I don't know if it's over. Is it known? People. Sorry. Well, if you rationally actually leave, leave, you should leave. You have kids leave, but they but it's easier us for us to Yeah, yeah. We really can't know. We really, really cannot know. Right. But here's a question. Here's a question to the community. Right. Yeah. Also, we have a passport that is um, up to date. Yes. Right. But here's a here's a question here's a question for the community well, knowing that america is really with all of its problems and all of its social ills is such a remarkable country and we have to be so grateful for it what should be a balanced healthy perspective of an american jew what how should an american jew like in this room where people are thinking and people are identifying and people are, 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 are really giving a lot of weight to their Jewish identity. And it's, I know it's not like that, like it, out in the world, but to this group, I wanna ask, what is, a, what, is, what is a good balanced perspective for an American Jew? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. If America were to go to war, I'm sorry, guys, you don't hear it on the phone. If America went to war in Israel, whose side would you be on? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, Israel, that might not be the But at the same time, there are people out there who do Look at the morning star. What happens in the morning star? The, oh, I thought you meant morning star, the, the fake bacon. I was like, don't no, tell me I can't no. eat that. 
I'm gonna be so depressed if I can't eat my baked bacon. Yeah. <laughs> like Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> Talk loud. Leslie comes big hit here. What does that mean? Strategy. So environmental, oh, social, oh. governance. Wait, hold on one second. Hannah. So, Morris, this is as Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Never heard this. Mm. So tell me, Leslie, from your experience, not, not in the details of the financial world, but in your experience, what is a balanced perspective for an American Jew to have? I'm not going to one who wants to be able to just you know, like the words. I always have a plan B. Always have a plan B. Uh -huh. And the plan B is. Uh huh. Okay, yeah, Doris. So, of course, now we just know that I will be my whole Talk louder. You are blessed that you were born in this country. Cherish your freedom, but understand as good as it's we are tolerated. We don't know for how long we are tolerated. Mm -hmm. I honestly fear for my children and grandchildren. Um, I'm very blessed up to this point not to have to feel threatened enough to have to leave this country. Mm -hmm. But I honestly think the Jewish people that that is our destiny. So you're saying from a perspective, like from the pers from the perspective is never be grateful for this country, but never confuse your gratitude with like complacency that you're you're that it's a given. History, Jewish people have experienced the golden age. We've all experienced the golden age in America for the last few generations. But I feel I know it sounds pessimistic, but that it has an expiration And I don't know. Okay, Gail, yeah. But guys, because I can because I want them to hear. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Did you, did you guys hear what she said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think about this a lot. 
<laughs> and one you'll never entertain. <laughs> that I want to be. And then when I'm with people, I feel very, very strong about my children. No, 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 no. It's the car. It's the car. Yes, no hypervigilance here. Okay, okay. So that's all I do. And then I feel like I'm very, very strong. Very strong. You know, and I just you have a deep you have a deep identification with Born after the war, you know, Holocaust parents and everything. But I grew up in Poland. Mm. I, from the time I was in the country, mm. I loved the cheese and was all my country. But then, a little bit older, I started being called them. And then I said, I feel and that I'm a Jew, but that's, they don't feel like this about me. So, in fact, I was a tourist there. When you said it, when you mm -hmm. start the class, the host country. You know, I host, this is our mm -hmm. host country. Things are population. Look at the map. I know, true, but I live somewhere uh -huh. else. I live in Skokie. Uh -huh. I see what's happening in Skokie. Yeah. It's like freaking mm -hmm. Halloween. <laughs> no, it's different, different world. So I'm afraid the way they, you know, I think that this is a host country. You have to be very grateful. I love this mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. But my passport is up to date. I mm -hmm. catch. And I'm gold because I'm telling you, this is this is my right. Like American Jews don't necessarily think like this, but ex-Soviet bloc but Jews think I like this. I may come. Holocaust and children of survivors. Come, you don't you consider yourself some some of our people consider that no, I'm an American, I have nothing to do with yes, they, are. they will be reminded otherwise. Just like I would be when I was a kid. It's not a poll, you're a Jew. Mm -hmm. well, the one thing that I always say to my friends, and I always just really think it's okay. In Israel's unfortunate in the United States. Mm -hmm. I throw all the things in the pot about all the things that we've done on the computer, phones, the matter of Take your ways out of your car. Our restaurant, right, right, right. And then they'd be at the corner and they just don't know what to say to me because they realize the reality of it. We will not have these things without Israel. So when you make the comment that Israel doesn't matter, is the most Insane, ridiculous comment anybody mm -hmm. could possibly make. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's horrific. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's they can't understand. Israel is like the most important place right now. My brother's paralyzed, okay? And now they're working on all this mm -hmm. stuff. Yes, they're working on re, re, rejuvenating the oh. spine. And it's unbelievable. Right. All this stuff. Right. But the reality of what's going on is 
the, the, the denial of what this country brings to this country is insane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wait, Julie, wait, hold on, Julie. Wait, one, one last time and then. Lighten it up. Should I do a dance on the table? <laughs> no, I will. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. No, right. So, 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 <laughs> right. I do hear that. And I think for, for people who came from Holocaust survivors and that they think like your your neurological wiring, you guys are just different. Your cells are different. You actually, you do have like trauma in the cells. It's just different. You think differently than American Jews, but this is not about uh, American Jewry become, it, I don't want to leave it heavy, although, although I do, I, I guess the way I would not lighten it up, but contextualize it is to say that the most important thing you can do as an American Jew is, is educate yourself, mm -hmm. educate yourself, mm -hmm. understand. It, it's like, imagine it's like, um, like, let's just think of Downton Abbey for a minute, right? My favorite show, right? So you're like in the middle of the beautiful English garden, right? If you're in the middle of the garden, all, you like kind of what Julie was saying, you see a beautiful flowery tree there and leaves here and you're in the garden. But learning Jewish history allows you to pull out and see the maze of the garden and understand the patterns of the garden. And sometimes there are people like children of survivors that naturally do this, maybe they've got trauma in the cells and maybe we don't have to, God forbid we should ever have it, but pulling out, looking at the garden and seeing the picture and saying, I recognize, I cannot take my freedom for granted here. I always need to understand there's a certain vulnerability in being in a host country. And I, I without being hypervigilant, without being anxiety ridden, without being super heavy, I need to understand that that Jewish history is patterned. It's patterned. It's not random. It's designed to instruct and move us towards somewhere. And so I, I have to be conscious. I have to be aware of the patterns of Jewish history. And I have to be smart. And I have to think smart. I don't have to be doomsday. And I don't, and I don't have to be anxious. Really, I don't have to be anxious. In the book of Tehillim, and I think this is so incredible, Lo Lefachet Klau, King David says, you don't have to be scared at all, which doesn't mean, it, we all know, we all sing the song, Kol Ha'olam Kulo, Gesher Tsar Ma'od. The whole world is a very narrow bridge. The Ha'ikar, but the main thing, Lo Lefachet Klau. The main thing is not to be afraid. What? Like the world's precarious, but you, the main thing, not just like, you know, try not to be too anxious. The main thing is not to be afraid. The, what does it mean the main thing is not to be afraid? It doesn't mean that difficult things don't happen. <laughs> it doesn't mean that really difficult things don't happen. But what it does mean is that history is moving in a direction. And that's what Kibbutz Golio means, the prophecy of Isaiah, which we're going to read in the Haftorah this week in synagogue, that we read every single 
um, Shabbat after Tisha B'Av, which is the de national day of Jewish mourning, where we mourn the destruction of Yerushalayim and Jerusalem, and we mourn the destruction of the temple, and we mourn the exile from our indigenous soil into 2,000 years of exile. These are the things we mourn on Tisha B'Av. And every, every, after Tisha B'Av, every year, we read consolation, consolation. It's ultimately going to be okay, because you're going to see a time where Jews are going to return to the land of Israel, and all the nations are going to work their way back. And that, I, I, I can't fluff it up and make it pretty or lighten it up, but what I can do is, like, return us to the words of the prophet Isaiah, who says, after... Don't forget the, the this, well, we don't have time for the history of what the Haftarah is, but the, Moses is saying, Moses is saying, you know, Aaron was the good guy. Everyone loved Aaron. Aaron was the peacemaker. He made peace between people. He was the feel good brother. Moses loved his people like nothing, but he was tough. I mean, he was more, you know, on them. And he said, I'm telling you, I can't go in with you. I'm warning you. There's rules to this land. There's a script to this land you you're gonna you know there's a torah i'm warning you and 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 he prophesizes what we experienced and now isaiah comes along after the destruction of the first temple which which moses is warning the jewish people about and he says i'm consoling you that this is all for an ultimate conclusion i am consoling you that there's going to come a time where you're going to see everybody edging their way back and something rising and it's going to culminate in the messianic era I'm, I'm i'm consoling you and i'm not i can't console more than isaiah can i can only remind us that's what we're reading that's what we've read for so long every tour every just think about it like this this saturday morning every jewish synagogue every shul whether it's in Venice or Moscow or Yemen. No, I don't think there's any Jews left in Yemen. There's one left in Afghanistan. Um, in Iran, there's a couple left in Iran, right? Wherever, Pol there's a, surprisingly, there's a lot left in Poland. There's a lot in Poland, but you know, wherever you are, everybody's reading the same Torah, the same Torah portion, Ba'et Hanan, which is pretty intense. It's most the same, guys, <laughs> get with the picture. And then you read the Haftorah, which is Isaiah, which is, I'm, I'm consoling you. I'm soft, like Julie, want, Julie doesn't want us to leave heavy and sedated and freaked out. <laughs> she, so she's like, Allie, lighten it up a little. <laughs> so I, I can only lighten it up with the words of Isaiah, which are, be consoled because you're part of a, pro this is part of a process. We're moving towards something and ultimately it's going to culminate in, in, in the world, like, you know, like what Gail about, where everybody cares about each other. And every and and there's brotherhood and respect among people, and we all know the knowledge of God. I used to when North Report was crowded, which sadly, I mean, I guess that's part of the prophecy. Like, and the malls will become <laughs> condominiums. But when, when once upon a time when there were a lot of cars in North Report, my husband used to say, "Oh, like one day this will be like a synagogue, and everybody will be parked to like hear." hear the word of God, to hear Torah. That's the messianic era. Now you can't say it because it's behind a condo and there's no cars there. <laughs> oh, there's a beat up shell. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, so, but, but, so, so, so let Isaiah console you. Not Allie trying to make it lighter, but, but the words of the prophet that everyone's going to read on Saturday morning. Read. I'm comforting you. I'm comforting you because you're going to see something happening and it's going to end well. And it's going to end as the world should be. And, and that's the consolation. But the question is, and I'm just leaving it with you, you have the ones who kind of know because they, they're, they've been through it, right? This corner over here and somewhat, right? Because God will keep you over there, right? They know. But then you have American Jews who never knew that, right? So, so you just gotta be balanced about it and be smart about it, and 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 have and contextualize the American Jewish experience for what it is: amazing, secure, 
gratitude, 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 and um, careful, you know, and and be and don't and and don't be naive and be and and, and know your Jewish history. Yeah. So to end stories about how living in Israel. Oh, oh. I know. Not okay this part. No, I mean this part is so mad. Okay, I'll just give. Okay, I'll give a spiritual one, a culinary one, and a cultural one. Okay, I'll start with the loftier, right? The 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 spiritual one is that it's a living Judaism, like it's living. You go to the hotel and there's that. I mean, you guys probably saw this. Thousands of people. You 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 just you you the the when it's a holiday, the streets are just filled with that holiday. Your your bus driver's Jewish. You're everybody. It's it's everybody. It's unbelievably. It's living Judaism. It's it's like it's my my husband always says it's like you're not in the bleachers. You're in the game. You know, and that's real true. Like you're not in the bleachers, you're in the game and you see it, you see it all the time. Okay, culinary. As someone who's had to eat disgusting pizza and roast hamburger, like kosher restaurants, for the, the food, the pleasure of like cafes and the light and the vibrancy is just remarkable. The culture is remarkable. The music, the art, the, 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 the just the vibrancy of Jewish cultural life. I, I will say some of the things that are hard, but the things that are hard, if you put on your prophet Isaiah lenses, David always says, put on, put your prop, you know, put your lenses on, right? I'll tell you things that are un, almost unbearable, but if you put on the lenses of prophecy, they're magnificent. You feel like it's, a, it is so crowded. It is so crowded. There is so much traffic. So you can fetch about that because it's like, I mean, they can tell you, like, sometimes you're like, you know, did we bring a tent? Because we're going to be here for the next, right? And then the great thing is you're on the highway. It's your pet. I mean, they're, you're, you're in standstill traffic and the guy behind you is beeping. Like, yeah. what would you like me to do? <laughs> you know, but if you put your prophecy lenses on, you can turn around and say, this is Kibbutz Galia. Like, if this is like, this city, Yerushalayim, was built for horses and buggies. And now it, it is a thriving metropolis. They are like the, the stupid joke that you probably all heard is that the national bird of Israel is the crane, right? You have you not heard that stupid joke? Because ever, there's cranes everywhere, not the bird. There's cranes, there's building everywhere. They're building light rails through towns. They're, they're trying to turn a horse and buggy city that, that it's kind of like what Deborah was saying. Well, don't the Jews in Russia know that they can't like ally with someone like Putin? Well, didn't the Jews know they couldn't have known like when they built it they built it for the moment's needs and they were under terrible duress and trauma but now it's it's so alive and you know so it's so crowded you're in the supermarket and you're like oh this is so frustrating but you can put on your kibbutz gully lenses and say like god this is amazing like you are bringing your jewish people back <laughs> The food, the dates, <laughs> the dates, the food is, yes, yes. Do you feel like you're behind the Yes. Okay, good thing on this. You know who really Americanized Israel? Netanyahu. He was raised in Israel. And Netanyahu Americanized Israel. He, when he came back, at, you know, and, and played a pivotal role and then ultimately became the prime minister, he brought a lot of American sensibilities with him. And the Americans are Americanizing. But you know what? There's good and bad. Like every Aliyah, every country has an influence, every host country that experiences kibbutz galiot and comes back to the land we we call that like a specific oh the french aliyah the russian aliyah the american aliyah 
they have positive and not so positive influences on the country. So you could say the American, um, the American materialism or consumerism. Well, they don't really change. Their whole, the whole, the whole like raison d'etre of the real Haredi world is to preserve itself and preserve what was. But that being said, you're in Meisharim or Gula, and there's cell phone stores and everything is there. I mean, can't yeah, you can't, you can't you know. Yeah, I mean, I, let's put it like this. I could never go to Wilpon, a fraud for sure. I could never go. I could not learn a word of Hebrew and it would be okay. I'd feel stupid, but it would be okay. Everyone speaks English. Yeah, I kept everybody really long. Does anybody else have thoughts yet, Elaine? Well, no, I just, I was talking about the only of Israel. Yeah, and Israel is Yes, there's a lot of secularism and sometimes you meet like I'll tell you I'll give you an example from your family. When Alan's family came, oh, it's your family, it's not Alan's, it's yours, sorry. When your family came, she told me that they had never seen Havdalah, or someone in the family had never experienced Havdalah, the ceremony that would bring out the Shabbat. Yeah, so I was, you know, that that's just Elaine's family. Right. It's true, but they're still being, they're still part of like a, they still have a sensibility of, of themselves and they live within a Jewish calendar. And also, you never look at your own life. <laughs> right. So, so, an era. Yeah. Look, can you believe she knows that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, Elaine, we don't, first of all, I don't know. I don't know. But also, we just don't. That's true. But also there are so many miracles that we experience. The Jewish agency is closing. Like we don't know what's gonna happen with secular Israeli Israelis. Like, will the will the country become more obsessed? We just don't know. You know. They're still yeah. Less than they used to. They used to learn the Tanakh more than they do now. But okay, they're still in the Jewish. They're, they're holding. They have a chance, as opposed to American Jewry, where they might no longer have a chance at a certain point. You know, at a certain point. You know. Yeah. I I I hope this was like I know this isn't what this group typically does. So I hope it wasn't too I I'm worried, Mr. I, I hope it wasn't too heavy. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. She she drove to Toronto to get uh, to get one of the kids. Yes. Okay. I love you. Okay. Well, guys, I'm really, really sorry that you I'm really, really sorry that you could only, I know you put, did you hear me, Kathy? I could hear uh, you and parts of the conversation, yes. No, they weren't, they weren't. Plus, he's like, uh, he was, but he's not actually serving. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, like, I feel like you might have to I know, I know, I know. I'm so glad you came. I'm so glad you came.
Thank you so much. I, I always have a joy to spend time with you. Amazing kids. <laughs> Yeah. And so, you know, I'm sure you're talking about being a you right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're so, like living and breathing Jewish life. Not even right. really knowing what class. All the Jewish history is miraculous. So the idea that something like crazy miraculous ever happened is not unreal. It's not unrealistic. I don't believe in miracles. But even Ben Gurion was so secular, said, what did he say about miracles? That, oh, a Jew who doesn't believe in miracles is not a realist, right? Not for a while. We'll think of all of it. So I'm here for two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, I want to spend time. And happy belated birthday. <laughs> I, that was it's not usually so gentle. Thank you. I love her right now. I'm so happy. Oh, she told me her. Wait, who'd you bring? She told me her mom. I, I just spaced out. She told me that all my mom was going to come to class. I, I spaced out on her. That is so fantastic. That was so funny. Okay, tell me your person. In Palestine came in the 20s to the States. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's His whole not family true. died in an epidemic. Yeah. And so during they, the during the whole thing, he was on the Ottoman. Uh, I, the Ottoman I don't know if the British were there then. Yeah. I think the British were well, there. Well, unbelievable. Yeah. They came in spirits, you know, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, the whole thing. Wow. I mean, you hear Europe all the time, but you don't hear from Palestine all the time. That's so he came from Palestine. Good. And now I'm just going to put your money under your mattress. But you know what? Can I just say one thing? Even from an economic perspective, forget all the medical components, all the, all the Judaic components. The idea of money is insecure right now. It's not that bizarre. And then Yes, it does. We can promise ourselves that if you think of it like a football, like if a football's made okay. out of like a leather that expands, it's made out of a tiny strip in the football, made out of a tiny strip of leather that's stretched to surround. So the other Israel will accommodate. And I love you. Even from a non miracles perspective, you have the negative, you have the norm, you have a lot. Areas that are un, under, un, you know, that are not yet fully developed. So it's like a built upon. They'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes, yes, yes. But I'm giving you my Israeli Do you come on? I can. Yeah. Let me know. Oh my gosh. Oh, it would be lovely to see. I would love to. I'll meet you guys for dinner or wherever. You know. Oh, it's so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't, it's not usually, it's atypical. The Heim Center is usually more, not as heavy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I'm so glad. Thank you. I'm so happy. So come back. I'll see you. Come for sure. Thank you. Uh, and that's on uh, well okay. Can I just say bye? Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Oh, Look who brought me to this so morning. Yeah. People been here for a while. I know. I said you're famous from the. <laughs> from She's the, like, yeah. what? I'm old. I didn't sign. He always signs up. I got to end.